All right. Hey, YouTube, how's it going? Um, so it's Faz here from Faz Lifts. And um, today I want to offer you a free four day intermediate routine. Um, so firstly, thanks for making it onto my channel. If you have any questions or comments, pop them down below. And if you'd like to work with me on your own strength and physique goals, there's a link in the description. Now, I want to give you guys a free four day routine and not just any routine, but this is a routine which was used heavily during the time I was growing up by a lot of the guys in the local area. Now, for those of you who are familiar with my channel, you'll know that I grew up right about an hour away from Doran Yates' original Temple Gym. Now, the cool thing was in the late 90s, around about the time Dorian was really sort of dominant in the local scene, um, pretty much all the guys knew him and they all went over to Birmingham to train with him. And uh, the whole area around Birmingham, Leicester, Nottingham, Derby, all the bodybuilders around that area were all kind of connected and they'd go and train with each other. So you had Ernie Taylor, if you remember him, Mr. Triceps, you had Dennis Francis from Leicester, and they'd all kind of train with each other as well as a slew of amateur bodybuilders. And they all pretty much trained the same way. And that's kind of what I'm demonstrating today because I don't want that routine to die because it's what I was taught, it's what I saw when I spoke to people, even the gyms around were sort of molded so you could do stuff like this. So they had the pullover machines, the special door in the eight row machine, which now Hammer Strength produces. And I just don't want it to die. So I think it's a great routine. It's, it's, track, it's got a track record for producing loads of great results with loads of physiques, both natural and enhanced. So I thought it'd be really cool to talk to you guys about, about what it's about. So let's, uh, let's get started. So yeah, this was pretty much exclusively the routine used by the majority of the old school guys and the ones that they taught. So if you were around in the late 90s, around the Midlands area, you'd probably be training like this. And for those guys who they taught, they taught a bunch of guys in the early 2000s, they all trained like this and they all got really, really big and strong. It's very Dorian-esque. Now, whether the routine was originated by Dorian or not is kind of up for debate. It was just kind of a done thing back then. But I've also seen um, Chris Aceto talk about a similar routine in his book. So I don't know if it's, it's, but nowadays it's commonly attributed to Dorian. The focus was on set execution. So the quality of the work was absolutely paramount. Like they didn't really discuss training to failure or not. It was just acknowledge that that's what you did as well as four steps and negatives. But what was highly, highly important and valued was the execution. So these big guys, they really, really valued the execution of the set. No sloppy training was allowed at all. The volume looked low on paper, but actually the warm-ups were very, very thorough. So what some guys in the gym might consider to be working sets, these guys would consider to be warm-ups. And that was quite interesting to me when I worked in with some of these guys. One of the guys at the old school gym that I used to train at, he uh, trained with Dorian directly and he was taught by Dorian and he taught me. So when I worked in with him for a few sessions, just because I was interested, um, it was interesting to me how thorough the warm-ups were. Like the warm-ups were moderate repetition and pretty close to failure. So they were relatively similar to what some people would consider to be working sets. Um, I remember specifically doing some um, final working sets of uh, Dumba lateral raises and they were all paused at the top. Um, then they were done close to failure, you know, up to 10 to 12 reps. So what, were considered, what would be considered to be actually pretty decent rep, pretty decent sets. But uh, the ones that were counted were only the ones where you did the forced reps and the negatives and all that stuff. So if you didn't go fully to failure and do four reps and negatives, it just wasn't really counted as a set. So take from that what you will about the volume count of what um, those early routines were. Anyway, so the rough outline is this. Um, day one, chest and biceps. Day two, quads, hamstrings and calves, so basically a leg day. Day three was typically taken off after legs. Then your shoulders and triceps and then back and abs off and then you'd repeat. So it was basically a six day rotation. Now. This can be done as a five-day rotation. You just take out the middle off day. So you do four days, take a day off, and then repeat. Or it can be done as a seven-day schedule where you just have a couple of days off. Um, you have one more day off per week. Also, what was encouraged was four sessions of 20 to 30 minutes of light cardio. Generally, this would be done after the session, and it would just be a way of cooling down and just having a chat with the lads. That was what we did. Um, it was just standard. It wasn't really, it was done all of the whole year, on season, off season, whatever. You would just finish your workout, get onto the treadmill, get onto the bike, usually the bike, and just have a chat about the session, have a chat about your day, because during the session, you weren't talking, you were training. <laughs> so um, it was seen as a kind of a social thing as well, but that's that's kind of how it was done. 
Okay, so that's the general outline. Now, in terms of how to execute the sets and reps, this is, I guess, where we need clarification. Now, traditionally, it was just one top set with four streps and negatives where appropriate. So it was generally a set of about six to eight with two or three additional four streps and one or two negatives. So each set was like really intense. However, as I say, the warm-ups were very, very thorough. Um, so while the final warm -up set was quite thorough and quite heavy, it wasn't considered to be an actual set because you didn't take it to failure. You were pretty close though. So the actual working sets were pretty much always with additional four straps and negatives. It was unusual not to do four straps and negatives on the actual working sets. It was very unusual, particularly if you were serious. Like if you if you were serious, if you were eating and you were, you know, the full diet, you were trying to gain weight, it, it would be very unusual for you not to call for four straps and negatives. Somebody would try and support you to do a couple of four straps at the end. And it wouldn't be to help you get your last reps. It would literally be, okay, you're about to fail. I'm going to force out one or two more or two or three more. And then once we finish that, I'm going to lift it up to the top position and you're going to um, resist until um, you just can't move anymore. So there was that intense. I would recommend if you don't train with a partner, um, this is probably not the type of thing you can communicate to a random guy at the gym. So it would be disastrous. So if you don't train with a partner, I would recommend just doing two working sets. So perhaps doing one set in the six to eight range um, or whatever safe for the exercise, maybe six to 12, and then doing an additional set, which is a more of a high rep set. That would compensate for the intensity reduction. If you're training either to or close to failure and not doing the four straps and negatives, um, yeah, possibly just do two sets rather than one as a bit of a compromise. Next up, um, this is kind of how it would look like. So if we just give you a closer look here. So on the left-hand side, you have the, if you are going to go down the four straps and negatives route, you do some thorough warm up. So sets one to four would be just warming up, okay, depending on how strong you are. You do your final working set, which should be your first working set if you're doing that approach with four straps and negatives. Exercises like the leg press, hack squats, only ever really did four straps. This is one of the reasons why when you're doing your leg day, squats generally weren't performed. It was our leg press and hack squat machines were always in use. Um, and hack squats were, were really seen as like a prized exercise for quad development. And if you could get up to five plates a side on the hack squat, you would consider to be strong. Um, generally, we do four straps on those, um, you know, maybe one or two four straps. Um, we didn't do negatives on hack squat because it was just too dangerous. On deadlifts, we only ever went to failure. There was no four straps on those. Now, for the more modern version of these, um, I would say if you are working without a partner, you're just trying to do this yourself. If you want to do this routine, but you're just doing it by yourself, um, just do like a first working set of any between six to 12 reps. Like you don't want to go to six to eight reps to failure on preacher curl, for example. Go, six, more, go more in the top end range, more like set of 10 to 12 and do your second working set you know, in a higher rep range, up to 20 reps. So that's what I would recommend as more of a modern version if you're not looking to uh, do the four straps and negatives if you don't have access to a partner, or if you just don't fancy doing it, because I know it's, it can be quite a stressful way to train. It, it can be very, very intense. So for some people, it's just not what they want to do. Okay, so first day would be something like this, um, four exercises for the chest, about three exercises for the biceps, Generally, the inclined barbell bench was a good one to start with. Um, the flat bench wasn't really done that much for whatever reason. Um, after that, something along the lines of flies, then flat dumbbell bench, perhaps a machine press as well. Then finishing off with something like either a pec deck or a crossover. This is all pretty flexible though. Uh, I would just really pay attention to the number of exercises and how they're executed. For biceps, about three variations. And I think for this is quite, you got it's quite important to have a decent variety for a, a decent range of variety here so i've got the behind the back cable curl or that could be the seated incline dumbbell curl just something with your biceps in the stretch position um so the elbow behind your back um then preacher curl so something with your arms in front of you and then a standard curl any of those could be changed out so the behind the back cable curl could be i'd say a seated incline dumbbell curl a preacher curl could be a machine, it could be barbells, it could be dumbbells, whatever. And a standard curl could be barbells or dumbbells or some kind of machine exercise. But um, that's the basic layout for a chest and bicep day. And again, with the whole either one set to failure with four straps and negatives and thorough warm-ups or um, the two sets to failure. 
Again, thorough warm-ups too. Uh, warm-ups are very important for, for the low-volume approach. You'll find one of the reasons that low-volume approach works so well, if it's done correctly, is your warm-ups should be quite thorough. So you make up the volume anyway, but you also prioritize really, really good set execution and intensity of effort. Next is the leg day. Um, it would look something like this. Pretty much always the leg days will be started off with leg extensions. I don't recall any leg day which we didn't start with leg extensions. Um, we never went straight into squats. It just wasn't done. More often than not, after leg extensions was a leg press. We had a very solid old school 45 degree leg press, like a sled leg press. And it was just the idea was just to get as deep as possible. Full range of motion was again very, very much valued. And if you look at old Dorian training tapes, you see how full his range of motion was. And then after that, you finish off with some kind of squat. We had both a pendulum squat and we had a hack squat. Either of those would be acceptable. Um, the hack squat was used more. Um, and as I say, if you could get up to five plates aside on the hack squat, you consider it to be very, very strong. After that, you finish off with what would normally happen is you'd have a, a five minute break. So we would just hang around the reception, have a drink, have a chat, just to let some of the fatigue drop off because those sets would be absolutely brutal. I've seen guys go to utter failure on squats on one set and it, it doesn't happen very often. There's probably a handful of guys I've seen do that and actually go to failure on squats. And But I would see at the old gym. Going to failure on squats is absolutely brutal. I mean, it happens every now and again if people attempt, you know, one rep max, but actually going to failure on a moderate to eight to 12 rep set of squat is horrendous. Actually dropping to the pins is awful. But um, I would see that and it would just be ridiculously high levels of effort. But those guys grew, you know, um, and they weren't overtraining because it was <laughs> one, top, one top set. After that, after a short break, leg curl and the stiff leg deadlifts, leg curls would be taken to failure and beyond. Stiff leg deadlifts would just be taken to failure. And then to finish off, um, standing and seated calf raises would be done. Next up after a day off, usually, would be uh, delts and triceps. Again, something like four delt exercises. You would normally lead in with a, a side delt exercise. Um, so something like dumbbell side laterals. After that, the main press was normally on a Smith machine. Then upright rows, usually finish off with cables. And for triceps, they wouldn't always do all three. Um, the close grip bench press was a popular one. Overhead extensions were popular. And just your stand pushdowns are popular. I think that's a pretty good tricep workout because you're hitting things from all angles. You're hitting something for the bulk, hitting something overhead, and hitting something below. So I think that's a pretty good way to go. Um, yeah. So that's delts and tries. And again, any of these can be substituted out for machines that you're more suited to or whatever you prefer to do. But sticking to the rough general outline of the exercises, the angles, and the sets and reps is probably a good idea. And finally, back and abs. So as you all know, Dorian was famous for his back. And uh, pretty much every gym in the area who was kind of a Dorian follower had one of those classic mach pullover machines. So the gym that I was at had a classic Dorian Yates pullover machine and also one of the chest support rows, which you've all seen in the black and white photos. So pullover, chest support row was done first. You'll notice that all the back exercises, they weren't limited by the lower back at all. That was something that was highly emphasized. And it influenced my training a lot when I was younger. I didn't like a lot of bent over rows. They just weren't they, you were limited by your lower back quite heavily, so they weren't promoted at all. There were a lot of back machines, and also dumbbells were highly valued. If you could dumbbell row properly, you know, with good execution, 60 to 80 kilo dumbbells, you were considered to be strong. So that is one knee on the bench, one arm braced, and rowing correctly and, and properly into your, strictly into your, into your stomach, uh, not sort of swinging and cheating. That wasn't, that was frowned upon as was any form deviation. Form had to be executed very, very well. So generally you'd start off with a pullover, then a chest support row, a dumbbell row, underhand pull downs, usually pausing at the chest and then finally finish off with some shrugs. And then one or two ab exercises. We had an ab machine at the gym, which was quite good, but you can get a similar motion with a cable crunch and usually finishing off with knee raises and then onto cardio. So some notes, um, the routine is scheduled to emphasize overlap. So you might be wondering why the odd placement, if you're not used to this type of split, why do chest and biceps, why not do chest and triceps? It's different from like a push-pull leg split because you're supposed to have overlap. The smaller muscle groups all have overlap. So the chest is technically trained twice a week because it also has overlap on the triceps and shoulder day with the close grip bench and the shoulder exercises. Triceps are trained definitely twice, biceps are trained twice with biceps and then on back day as well. 
So the only things that aren't trained twice are legs and back, which were considered to be larger muscle groups, which needed more time to recover. So the split was very purposeful. Next thing is quality of execution was everything. People were literally reprimanded for if their form was sloppy. Like it wasn't sloppy form was was not considered to be a good like if you if you lifted a little bit heavier and you just heaved it up it was considered to be really off like somebody was somebody would talk to you and these guys were like really big like you know butch guys i mean but they would have a word with you they wouldn't be the execution was prized it, there was a definitely a way to do things sloppy reps were not considered to be a good thing at all Level of intensity was high, but it was very, very much directed at the muscles. And um, I still see a couple of these guys, a um, couple of the younger guys who they taught, and they still see them train. And the execution is insanely precise, and that's what you want to aim for. Training to failure and beyond was highly encouraged. Basically, for these guys, failure, going to failure was a minimum. That's where, essentially, the set started. The four straps and the negatives, you would do maybe an additional five reps you know of four straps and negatives combined so maybe three additional four straps and two additional negatives depending on how much your partner <laughs> was hated you that particular day so failure was a minimum um and after that you're doing like an additional five reps which were comprised of you know four straps and negatives so um you know it, it was hard hard training um the message was sent to the muscle to grow All right folks so um i wanted to give you this because one, like it's a bit of my history, yeah. Um, two, I don't want the routine to die because I think it's very valuable. It's put a lot of muscle on a lot of people and I just wanted to give you guys something um, which you might want to experiment with. It is very different. It's You'll notice that there's no discussion really of the merits of training to failure. It was just assumed you went there. It was more like the merits of, you know, four straps and negatives. There's also no discussion of volume and some of you might be sort of counting up the volume but um, we didn't really discuss that kind of stuff back then. In the early 2000s, there wasn't this whole training talk of should we go to failure or not? How much volume should we do? It was just assumed that failure was a given. I mean, why wouldn't you? The discussion was more around the negatives and the four straps. If there was conversation, it was more about that. Even the high volume guys pretty much took everything to failure or at least close to failure um, for the low volume crew. And they didn't, they didn't really question failure. They just went. And they didn't really call themselves a low volume crew. It was just the way to train. And each session would take about that long anyway. It's not like you would be in and out in 30 minutes. The session would take 60 minutes because there'd be so many warm-ups. You'd be thoroughly rested between each session, between each set. And the execution left you winded. You needed time to get your, your breath back because you're working so hard. It's dripping with sweat. So it's not like the time in the gym was any less. So it never felt like a low volume routine at the time. And this was way before your sort of, Mike Isretel came out with the whole MRV concept and, and all that type of stuff. Um, I didn't have any idea about like volume really, but in the early 2000s, um, we just kind of knew we needed more <laughs> than the bare minimum. And the execution needed to be very, very hard. And I think um, it was a simpler time, <laughs> but uh, it was probably, um, there were less questions, but certainly uh, there was probably less confusion as well because this was the way to train and everyone trained this way and everyone gained. So this was matched with a good diet, which was generally moderate protein, high carb, low fat, pretty much all the time. Um, and yeah, the guys who were a little bit more serious probably trained more on a five day a week rotation. They all did their cardio and uh, everyone grew. Um, you ate enough to grow, you did your cardio alongside it, you worked really hard and you, they valued adding weight to the bar. And you added weight when you were ready. It's That's something to touch on, actually, before we finish this video. You added weight when you were ready. There wasn't this desperation to add weight to the bar every week. You earned the addition of weight. You added it when you were ready. So let's say you went, you jumped up in weight, and the set was sloppy, and you knew it was sloppy, and your partner told you it was sloppy. Then you stick to that weight until you own the weight. And that's something which I'm going to do another video about at some point. But owning the weight is very important. You don't just have to get add weight to the bar every week. You can just get better at the set and there's a lot to be said for that so um i'll leave you with that if you guys decide to try this let me know but uh i just wanted to put this out there in the internet just to keep it alive but that's a little bit of my history